Hey everyone, welcome to part two of Shell Strategies. My name is Brian. Today we're gonna to continue on talking about Shell Strategy and really pick up where I left off, and that is taking the entire assembly and collapsing it down to a multi-body part and then automating, creating the surface bodies to go into simulation, and then we'll continue all the way through the end, uh, setting this thing up and looking at the results. Let's get going. And let me show you how fast this is because I can take that entire work that I did before in 30 to 40 minutes and do it in just two. So I'm gonna take back at the assembly, it's back at the solid now, and what I'm gonna do is do a file save as and take this assembly and save it as a part and specify all components, all right? Save that, open it up. So I basically created a multi-body part and you can see on the left-hand side I have 113 solid bodies. Let's just run the mid surface and find face pairs. And again, set that threshold or else it'll find any face pair that's parallel. And this took about five minutes to calculate, but look at that. It went through and found over 100 face pairs automatically. So you have to play with that threshold depending on your maximum material thickness. Now what I'm gonna do, of course, is do my keep body. So I just have surfaces and there we go. Automatically, boom, I have the entire model in that same surface state ready to feed into simulation. Now, uh, if you are in the conceptual phase or you wanna do some real upfront design uh, simulation work, you can also create conceptual models that are surfaces to begin with. So for example, I'm gonna design a new cabinet that has to withstand um, a dynamic or vibration load. Um, I know what the basic shape of the box is gonna be, so I can either go right to sheet metal and use the automated sheet metal methodology, but what if this box is in a larger assembly, right? Or, or if it's one component in this new concept I'm gonna do, then sometimes you wanna create a idealized model. So ideally you'll plan on building a shell model to verify this type of design before you even start. Uh, and you can create this real quick and dirty because I'm not worried about manufacturing features like hem, flanges. I'm just gonna create planar surfaces and swept features. So on the right hand side, you know, it's gonna be welded in it anyway. So let's just, in our design, uh, phase, assume it's a continuous piece of material. So let's get back now into that grain tower assembly and understand how the shell definition works and how you really would work with an assembly uh, at this scale. So let's make a new study and I'm always going to create it simple gravity only because I want to make sure everything is stuck together. So let's go ahead and just turn on gravity just so I don't forget. And then there's two things I'm gonna spend time on. One is defining all these surface body thicknesses and materials. So let's go in and take a look at this beam. I need to edit the definition. And the definition now of a shell includes not only the material, but also the thickness of it, okay? And this thickness can be linked to a parameter, or I can just type it in manually one by one. Now, shell manager, you gotta get comfortable with this because obviously I have some similar materials, so what Shell Manager allows me to do is create groups of shells that are the exact same. These vertical columns, for example, are all gonna be steel. They're all gonna be 625 wall thickness. So let's make a group, group them together, okay? Same thing for these floor panels. They're all starting off as a half inch plate. Great, let's go in and create a group. So grouping them together has a couple benefits. One, it obviously automates setting up a whole bunch together but what's also awesome is it keeps them linked together. All right, so if I need to change and do a thicker uh, floor panel or I need to do a thinner vertical column, I change one, every, it, it propagates through the group. All right, so you're adding in a lot of intelligence and automation into it. So here, let's just fast forward. Again, this takes uh, about 10, 15 minutes to set this up and <laughs> verify that I've uh, you know included everything. Here's my floor supports. I can also quickly look through the shell manager and see if I forgot something, click on it, and easily assign it to a group if I forgot it, like this uh, floor support here. There's a kick rail. So it makes it super simple to actually validate you have everything set up and assigned to the right group. And of course, you can even sort uh, these columns. So we'll go through, make sure I get everything set up. Excellent. Now to validate that the material and thickness are correct, we'll use the visualization, the color by. Everything here is just plain carbon steel. But I want to validate that the thickness is also correct. So I can paint the graphics here by the thickness. And this gives me a one-stop 
validation plot to make sure that things are the same are the same, as well as the thicknesses are correct, uh, as well as I've typed in, I haven't fat fingered anything because I shouldn't have any, you know, 190 millimeter plate. It should be uh, three quarters. So looks pretty good, right? So shell manager, hands down, amazing. Please use this. It validates it. It automates it. And we'll see later. I'm going to make a design change, which is, again, just changing one and it propagates through. Now, especially when you get into bigger and bigger assemblies, this is a huge 100 foot long structure. You know, you have to keep organized. And the old way of doing it was you had a piece of paper, a printout, and you would actually, you know, make sure and mark and jot down what each of the body thicknesses was. And then you'd validate over and over again that your shells were defined correctly. Again, the shell manager to me makes short work of that. All you have to do is validate the group is defined correctly and then things belong to the right group. So after that setup, let's just mesh it real quick. I like the curvature based measure because a lot of we have a lot of curved fillet, obviously uh, edges from the structural steel and the bends. And again, it's a no, a no brainer. Now it's interesting to note that here I've created, I don't know, not even a hundred thousand elements. If this were solid, It'd be in the millions. In fact, I tried to run it as a solid uh, and it just, it was crunching for an hour and I stopped it because the minimum size when I make the mesh is about five inches. And imagine trying to put a five inch element across a quarter inch wall thickness. It just ain't going to work. So what's awesome is we've dramatically enhanced the automation capabilities under the hood for situations like that. Between 2009 and the 2016 release, we've automated numerous things such as face-to-face -face shell bonding, edge-to-edge, edge-to-face bonding. So in fact, pretty much everything, even shells, should auto-bond. And the key to that is setting up the global bonding condition and using the non-touching uh, faces. You can even do no penetration condition. So if there's a joint or a flange that, uh, you know, it's bolted, obviously, or they not welded together, you can either allow penetration or do a no penetration condition. And what's awesome, again, you're in sheet metal and you can still use things like pins and bolts. All right, so contacts are pretty easy. Let me show you the automated way of setting this up. Let's go into the global contact and turn on non-touching uh, faces. But here you gotta be careful, okay? If I make this too big, too many things will get bonded. It tells me my maximum shell thickness is 0.75, so let's make it half of that, all right? And then I'm gonna use the contact visualization plot to show me where it is gonna think everything is gonna be uh, glued together, basically. And you'll see right away, uh, pretty much everything's glued together, even the edge to edge. So again, that's something that's huge. It saves so much time and no longer have to set those contact sets up one to one. Um, I'm also gonna use unconstrained bodies. This is a new feature from last year, 2016. And this is gonna allow me in just a few minutes to figure out exactly what is uh, loose, if you will. So let's hit the calculate button and it's going to show me any bodies that aren't glued down and also animate them for me. Because um, even with that auto bonding with non-touching faces, there's a few things that are a little bit further apart, uh, like these column supports. So it's hard to see on the screen here, but it's actually highlighting in the dark blue, either the groups or the bodies that are free. It'll even animate for me the degrees of freedom. So I have this whole top platform that's obviously not stuck together and that's because those top column supports uh, didn't get auto bonded. So you got to check the contacts, all right, or else you'll still spend a lot of time just getting solver errors about the model being unstable. So use contact visualization to see where it's glued. That also helps you determine is, it, is the software gluing a whole face together? Is it gluing the edge to the face to understand what your assumptions are being? If you just put non-touching faces and a big number, it's just going to glue everything and you got to be careful. You might over stiffen your model. You can also use detect unconstrained bodies to check your contacts. In this case, I got to go back and add a local contact set. Uh, and also, like everything else, check your displacement results first when you get your results back. And that also means turning on that soft spring stabilization in the solver properties, solving it. And if you get that large displacement warning, say no, because you probably have a rigid body mode. Uh, and another way to figure that is this whole thing out and validate your contacts. Before we had detect unconstrained bodies, we'd use frequency study. If you have a SIM professional license, you set up a frequency, you know, drag and drop your static setup over, including your contacts, and then see where the, the first 20, 30, 40 frequencies are. If you have rigid body mode, of course, you'll just see the thing translate in its six degrees of freedom. But what, what's also nice is if you think you have it already, a frequency study helps you validate that there's not some, uh, you know, plate that's flapping around. 
So you should see in a structure like this a very uh, uh, nice solid frequency where the whole thing is moving. If anything's loose as you go to the higher frequencies, you'll see plates flapping up and down. So it's kind of like shaking the whole thing and making sure it's glued all the way around. That's a great trick. Another thing, again, when you're validating these contacts is make sure you understand how this thing is going to be manufactured. You know, I'm going to write down or hopefully have a documentation of where my welds are going to be. All right. And then I'm going to go through and when I validate my contacts, I'm going to line that up. So where everything is continuously welded, I'm going to usually have an edge to face bonded contact set. In a first pass, maybe I'll just do face to face bonded, but then I'll get in and maybe just make a local set of edge to face. And if there's a place where it's not going to be welded together, okay, I'm going to go in and use maybe a local contact set to allow penetration. So I can do a global bonded to stick everything together. And then where I need to add in refinements or corrections, I'll do a local contact set. Locally allow penetration between these two faces, and then locally bond the edge to the face. Or locally no penetration between these two and put in pin to represent uh, a rivet. For, for example, okay? So always trust your contact visualization result as well as looking at your displacement in your model. So how do we look at the results from a shell analysis? Let's take a look. And with shell, there's a couple things to keep in mind. One is that there is a virtual top and virtual bottom to the shell elements. You wanna look at both for the max stress. Both a nice new option uh, in SolidWorks simulation, you can actually render in 3D and view both top and bottom as though it were a solid. Let's also look at real quick an example of the stress of the bonded contacts, because that's not always the most accurate. And let me get into weld and connector analysis real briefly, but that'll be a future episode because that's a whole topic worthy of several series. So with the contacts all set up, I am still doing my gravity only study. Let's let this thing solve. Uh, with this shell mesh, everything bonded. Uh, this, this I think took about five minutes uh, to solve or so. And this is where, again, I'm validating looking at the displacement. Here you can obviously see that I passed through the floor supports. Okay, no problem. What I'm going to do is just maybe uh, modify my global contact to be a little bit bigger. But in fact, if I was going to do this uh, maybe more accurately, I wouldn't just bump that up or else it's going to glue the flange to the bottom panel. I'd probably go in and do local edge to face to make sure it's representing that more like the weld. All right, so it's all glued together well now. You can see it's uh, pretty much all stitched together. Maybe a few local contact sets I still need to create, but you, you get the idea. Just using the automated global contact gets you pretty far. Does the displacement make sense? About a millimeter? Uh, sure, under gravity, makes sense to me. Under the advanced options, here's where I see the render shell thickness in 3D for my displacement. And this is nice, it gives you a really good graphic. It almost looks like it's solid. And this is better really for the stress results because when I look at the stress plot, I have to choose top or bottom. I can also break into components, membrane and bending, but here I'm looking at the top stress. Let's edit the plot a little bit here to set the scale and the units. Uh, maybe show a max flag. Stress seem reasonable? Sure. You know, it's definitely in the one to 2000 range for the most part. Let's look at the bottom stress. And you see the maximum uh, here is about 19,000 and um, one of the connections, one of the weld connections. I'm gonna use ISO clipping though to take a look and see if the stress is flowing continually. Again, if you see a, a beam that's not taking any load, well, it's probably not connected. Use gravity only, make sure everything's connected, and then duplicate that study and let's create the actual working load. In this case, a 10,000 total pound loading distributed across it. And now I'm starting to get some real results. We see that big bending as we'd expect on the bottom of those uh, floor supports. I'm seeing a pretty high stress hotspot of 70,000 in, in that same critical connection. I use ISO clipping to take a look at where the load path goes, as well as here, if I'm still in the design phase, maybe those columns are over-designed. I'm gonna change those main vertical columns from 625 uh, to, to 500 thousandths, half inch thickness, and check it out, it changes everything for me. So the shell manager, again, is great if you're still in that design phase, going between result and CAD, and just changing the thicknesses here instead of going back, changing the weldment profile or changing the sheet metal thickness. So it still looks pretty good, uh, even with that, that thinner, uh, less expensive wall thickness. 
All right, let's add some more realism though. Let's say we're progressing further we, and we wanna get into the critical stress area. And you can see at the corners where the columns actually intersect uh, the platform, uh, there's some, some red hotspots. So let's go in and add some more granularity there. So here, the model on the left has a compatible mesh because I used the split line. The one on the right is incompatible mesh because I just didn't do the split line. And the biggest difference here, of course, you can see the stress result and the continuity. In the compatible mesh, there's a reduced stress on the vertical component that just isn't there on the incompatible model. And this is due to the stress averaging, okay? Because we all know nodal stress averages the displayed, uh, displayed stress. So when the model is compatible, the stress on the first row of elements on the vertical member is the average. On the right-hand side, since there isn't connectivity, there's no averaging. So, uh, well, which is right? That's a big question. Um, now, when I'm looking at stress literally here, that's suspect to begin with, because in reality, I don't wanna really look at a weld factor of safety by looking at the stress. Uh, what I really want to do is extract the interface forces and do a weld factor safety calculation or use the weld connector to do that in Simulation Professional. Uh, in fact, you can make a case for each of these models, um, but the important thing is here, don't necessarily rely on this as your ultimate stress answer when you're looking at the junction uh, between two shells. So let's take a look back here. And remember, my rule of thumb is bond everything and then add more accuracy. Here, let's do the split line technique to make sure that the nodes are gonna line up in my bonded contact set. So I'm gonna create a split line on my uh, plate here and then change and fix my contact set so my edge is being bonded to that face. Okay, this will give me more continuity in the results. I'm also gonna add in a bolt connector, right? This top flange is bolted to the flange of the platform uh, with a pretty large bolt. Let's put a preload on there and of course, if I'm going to do this type of connection, I wanna do a local no penetration between those shells. And I'm also gonna represent the welds that we're gonna have by allowing penetration between those faces and then doing a local bonded between the edge and the faces. So that gives me more accuracy in terms of representing the stiffness that the weld would create. And if I have a staggered weld, of course I can create split lines and only do certain edges. Here, let's create a reference point. I've already solved it. Let's create a reference point in a reference coordinate system because what I'm gonna do is list out the interface forces. So let's assume that this was my worst case juncture and I gotta do a weld analysis. What I can do is using that coordinate system and selecting the edges is I can get the forces and moments either as a sum total uh, or on each line. And I can of course use this to drive a downstream uh, weld analysis. And of course, since I used a bolt connector or a pin connector, I can extract a table of my fastener forces, axial, bending, shear, uh, and use that to do a fastener factor of safety. So weld analysis, we don't have time to cover here, but that's really the basic principle. Don't so much look at the stress in the shell, uh, but look at the interface force and you know, reference Shigley, for example, he gives a great example of doing a hand calc based on the profile of the weld and the free body uh, forces and moments. Well, thanks for sticking around through this episode. I hope you got a lot out of it from how to use the surface bodies to using the shell manager, as well as setting up contacts and validating them. And of course, looking at the results. Shell meshing is a big world and we didn't get into a lot of the nitty gritty when it comes to weld analysis or mesh refinement. Uh, but this gives you the idea of where to start and it starts with being comfortable uh, with surface bodies. So good luck and I can't wait to see what you guys analyze with your giant shell analyses. Thanks, see you next time.